Uh, this is Aaron Murakami, and uh, today is Sunday, March 17th, 2019, and this will be a live uh, call with uh, Eric Dollard. And um, we'll just go through a few announcements, a couple updates, and then we'll go ahead and open up for questions. Um, so Eric's website is uh, ericpdollard.com. That's uh, P for Paul, his middle initial. So ericpdollard.com. And on that site in the right column, um, if you'd like to support uh, EPD Laboratories, Inc., which is a 501c3 nonprofit uh, organization, all the uh, donations are tax deductible. And if you would like to help uh, pitch in um, to help support this work, then you can do that uh, either by PayPal, uh, there's a donate button, or you can uh, mail a check or a money order or cashier's check to a P.O. box uh, listed there for uh, EPD Laboratories, Inc., um, also, if you want to write Eric a personal letter, if you have a question for him, there is a Lone Pine address in the same right column of ericpdollar.com. It's a general delivery address, and uh, if you write him there, um, he'll write you back, uh, usually. And uh, it might take a few weeks, but uh, you know, a couple times a month, he does make it to uh, Lone Pine to check his mail uh, to pick that up. So um, if you do have any specific questions, technical questions for him. Uh, rather than emailing me to pass it on, it's better to just um, write the letter directly to Eric so he can uh, correspond with you directly, uh, which is better anyway. Um, also, uh, in uh, July 11, 11th through the uh, 14th, we're going to have the uh, 8th Annual Energy Science and Technology Conference for 2019, and uh, Eric will be giving two presentations at that conference. Um, one is going to be on uh, Tesla's uh, Colorado Springs um, magnifying transmitter. He's going to go into, you know, some of the theory and some of the math. And, and we also have somebody that we're working with, uh, Bruce, over on the East Coast, who's actually uh, uh, building and uh, assembling the uh, scale model, which will be demonstrated at the conference, which will have a transmitter and also a receiver. And so... Um, uh, I do want to uh, make mention that recently uh, we have received a uh, good handful of uh, donations, and I just want to thank everybody, and especially to David and Sam. Obviously, I'm not going to say the last names, but there were a couple sizable donations that helped uh, to relieve uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, financial stress on the organization. Uh, that money is mostly going to go to um, operating expenses. Um, as many of you know, the building was paid off um, you know, some months ago, so the operating expenses have, has uh, come down quite a bit. Um, it's also going to go to whatever books and, um, you know, stuff that Eric needs to continue some of his writing projects. And also um, there was enough money where um, we were able to outright purchase all the uh, parts um, for the Colorado Springs uh, replica uh, that uh, Bruce uh, Gavin is still, he's still receiving the parts and um, it's also going to help us pay for uh, some of the labor behind that because he's going to have to put in a lot of hours uh, to be able to do that. Uh, right now, um, do you have any uh, announcements, Eric, that you want to make or any kind of updates you want to give on, on what's been going on lately? No, I've mainly just been writing up the, um, the descriptive material to the equations and diagrams that I put on the website several months back, so that's been keeping me busy. So I've got about okay. 100 pages of a handwritten done on that, and I'm about halfway through. So, And that will become, probably will become a forthcoming book, which will be kind of a sequel to all of the Lone Pine writings. Okay. So um, the most recent papers that were posted on the website at ericpdollar.com, um, if any of you go to ericpdollar.com, you'll see a, a link in the main menu bar, which is free papers. And if you click on that free papers link, um, it will bring you to a list of some papers. This is not a, um, a complete list by any means, but it has some of the more recent stuff. That this will be updated at some point. But... Um, the most recent papers, would you say that NVE1 report, that's kind of the first one to kick off this series, Eric? Yeah. Okay, so that's the Electrical Utility in a Digital Age Engineering Report, NVE1. That's a free PDF. You can just go to that free papers link on ericpdollar.com, click on that, and you'll get the PDF. And that's kind of a, I don't know what it was, maybe 10, 
10 pages or 10, 15 pages or something like that, kind of a summary of Eric's last um, five-hour presentation, which was on the history, theory, and practice of the electrical utility system, and, um, you know, which addresses kind of the degradation of the whole power grid and how it's kind of gone downhill and is actually making it more susceptible to EMP damage. And that's kind of what that paper goes into. And then do um, you want to kind of give a little summary on what the electromagnetic boundary condition paper is, which is a little bit more mathematical? Yeah, so that's um, kind of what I'm doing is, is writing the last presentation up as a book. There seems to be quite a bit of demand for certain chapters out of that. So, so yeah, the, um, the, the one that you just got or just typed, that is uh, basically trying to revive the science of electricity, which has been thoroughly dead since the days of Einstein and his cohorts. So I'm trying to bring that back. To, uh, to make it so we have the science of electricity again. Uh, I read several books in preparing for, for that particular series of articles, which now is kind of put on the back burner because I have so many other things to write. But um, it kind of shows how everything went wrong, and I, I quote all the, the main people involved and don't do much, much of my own commentary on that so it's quite a bit of references and then anyone that wants to go to the references uh, there's quite a bit of material in those references that you can get an idea of how the science of electricity evaporated and got buried and consequently that has led to quite a disaster present day of what's going on in the world of uh, electrical engineering there really are no more engineers uh, I consider Basically, the situation, a national emergency, it's getting so severe that, um, that it's, uh, I don't, I'm at loss of words to describe it, uh, but, but quantitatively speaking, this NV energy that we have here in Nevada is really one of the worst perpetrators of this electromagnetic catastrophe. Uh, they're just completely cheating on everything. They have so much stray electricity flowing in the ground that it is 20 million times stronger than the signal we're trying to receive out of the ground. So it was really a, a fatal blow to a lot of research here that, um, that everything is just jammed out with uh, stray electricity flowing in the earth. And it looks like it might require um, some punitive action from a political legal standpoint because the situation right now is a danger to the entire community here. Uh, what Envy Energy is doing is they're no longer putting the Delta tie together winding in their substation transformers. They're YY connecting them and connecting the grid neutral to the distribution neutral and then relying on the plumbing and the ground rods here in the town to return the zero sequence currents from the substation back to the distant transmitting or transmitting substation or transmission substation. And there are literally millions of watts of stray electricity circulating around in the earth, as was evidenced by the interference. Uh, my lineman and myself, we did a, a small video of our, our test antenna out there and actually showed the, on the oscilloscope and on the decibel meter and what have you, how bad this is. And, uh, and it's not making it easy for us on other levels, too, because when it's time to get the terminal facility, the mine connected up to the power, uh, these people are going to jack us around. They're going to try to connect their hot, high-voltage neutral to our ground system. I've already caught them sneaking their hot neutral onto telephone cable sheets and uh, it's uh, it's absolutely amazing how far things have gone with the electrical system in this country. I don't know what's driving it. Uh, I just uh, received a call from a marine electrician in Oregon. He's scratching his head. Everything's being put in illegal. Nobody cares. The code enforcement and the regulatory agencies are just turning their head. Everything's burning up. And... Um, and for a person like me that's a third-generation electrical worker, I literally want to puke. 
So this most recent paper um, is called Revival of the Electrical Sciences in the Digital Age. Um, so Eric, Eric sent uh, is about 32 pages of handwritten notes, and that, that went into a 10-page PDF, which is the first one at the top of the list. So you can also download that. Uh, that's the one I just literally just finished uploading um, while on this call. And, uh, again, ericpdollard.com, click on the free papers link, and you can download um, Revival of Electrical Sciences in the Digital Age. Do you want to talk a little bit more about what's in that paper? Because it's kind of interesting because, you know, a lot of people who are kind of bucking against, you know, the normal story about everything with electron theory and this and that is that J.J. Thompson is kind of credited with, you know, so-called discovering the electron. But when you take a broader look at what J.J. Thompson is saying, um, he's pretty dismissive that there even is an electron. Do you want to kind of go into a little bit of that? Yeah, his his concept was kind of taken away from him and then turned into uh, an entity, which we now call the electron, which really kind of mixes a lot of things together that are not electrons, like cathode rays are not really electrons in the sense that the word electron is used. Today, beta rays are not really electrons. You go back to J.J. Thompson's work, uh, principally uh, a very extensive book he wrote called The Conduction of Electricity and Gases, which is mainly experimental accounts of all of the pioneers in this area. And none of the numbers really uh, of the different experiments follow very closely to each other. Nothing really seemed to be very determinate about the whole situation. So this, uh, this attitude that exists today, well, we just have this neat little ball bearing that we call the electron, and, and this and that is, is, is a, why would you say, it's a fiction, is what it is. So like I say, what I did is I got everybody's idea on it, you know, J.J. Thompson's ideas, uh, there's a, a physicist named Larmor who very few people have heard about, but he was very instrumental in the whole electron concept along with Lorentz. And there's his criticisms of the situation and his criticisms about the abolition of the ether. And then, of course, there's heavy side. A lot of references are made to heavy side that shows that electricity is not electrons flowing in wires. And, um, and then... Uh, Dr. Uh, Gustav Le Bon, who, even though he was a, uh, a doctor of the medical, I think psychological, uh, wrote, uh, did a lot of experiments and wrote about this stuff and showed how really it was all the electron theory is a complete fallacy and has just thrown everything off course. And, and accordingly, that's why we're having this disaster with the electrical utility system today is these uh, erroneous concepts have been made into uh, a way of doing business and they're ignoring the electric field and the harmonics and all the rest of the stuff and say it doesn't even exist. But, um, but at any rate, the interference it's causing, people getting shocks and the danger it, it poses to the community, not only from building things on erroneous theories, but failing to follow the basic construction laws of power lines and what have you is, um, is pretty disastrous. Yeah, so on the back of that paper are a list of references. Um, there's maybe, I don't know, six or seven or something different books are referenced, maybe more. J.J. Uh, uh, Thompson and um, I think like an E.T. Whitaker reference and some Steinmetz reference. And if you want to, if anybody wants to find those books, um, not all of them are easily available, but some of them are. And if you go to archive.org, which is the um, uh, the Wayback Machine, it has a lot of the um, uh, scanned and old copies of those old copyright, uh, you know, books where the copyrights have expired. So if you go to archive.org, you can search for books by author or title name of any of the references in the back of that paper, and you can download the PDF or text doc or whatever whatever format you prefer. Um, now, at the conference, um, you know, your, your main presentation, which will be probably about a four-hour presentation on the Colorado Springs, you know, which will include a, a demo, 
There's also another presentation you'll be doing, which will probably be about a one-hour presentation on the seismic project. Do you want to kind of give a maybe a basic synopsis on what that presentation is going to be about? Because we, we haven't really mentioned that too much. Yeah, that's still kind of cooking. It all depends on what level of cooperation I can get out of various people to to share their research and, and what have you in this matter. So it's basically going to kind of show the, the various methodologies of earthquake forecasting that have been proven to work. Uh, there's the uh, Tony Fraser Smith was the one that discovered the magnetometer precursors. Uh, I talked to him personally. There's a scientist uh, by the name of uh, Friedemann Freunde, and he has given a theoretical basis for the electrical process of earthquakes. Uh, he doesn't really seem to want to contribute much to this effort, but, uh, but he has talked to me in detail about this, and I've remembered a lot of it, so I'll kind of get, I'll cover that there is a solid theoretical basis and experimental basis from my own work at Landers. You know, I'll show some graphs and what have you that uh, that earthquake forecasting is a reality, and uh, the USGS and these other agencies are just doing everything they can to fight it. And the researchers, like the ones I mentioned, which are their academics, uh, they seem to have an intrinsic opposition to building anything that works because it seems to compete with their academic endeavors. So it's really quite a futile effort to produce anything like this. Uh, we do have two um, kind of emergency level sites going together. They're usually what we call rat camp zebras where the stuff is patched together with field telephone wire and what have you in the forest and boxes screwed to trees and what have you. So one is up and running. Right now, it's Camp Simeon, and we expect to have it on the air by the end of the year, and then, then one up near Bolinas, which we call Camp Gregorio. Uh, that will probably take about a year from present to get together because of all the other stuff that's scheduled, but I would estimate by the middle, towards the end of next year, we will have a stereo uh, signal on the Internet of the... San Gregorio, San Andreas section of Central California so that these signals will be available on a 24-hour basis for people to listen to. And then once we have the money to bring these things together at the central office here, then they'll be phased and, and made part of the predictive uh, process for the earthquakes. Okay. Um, also, um, here in the near future, we're going to be having a couple more of Eric's books on uh, Amazon. Um, one of our friends, in uh, 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 Simon, um, is working on um, putting Verser Algebra 1 and Verser Algebra 2 into some uh, templates for uh, Amazon. So as soon as that's done, we'll be uploading those, and Verser Algebra 1 and 2 will both be available as uh, paperbacks and we'll definitely give announcements uh, when those are available. Um, and, of course, Eric will, will send some more um, notes that we'll be transcribing and making available. Uh, some of it will be going into a new book. Some of it will not. But um, from this point on, any kind of, anything that's, that's going to be written material or, or going in templates compatible with uh, Amazon so we can get those uh, both as – you know, PDFs for the uh, ebook versions, um, but they'll also be available as uh, paperbacks, which uh, uh, quite a few people have wanted for quite a while. Um, do you have any other announcements or anything you want to go over before opening up for some questions? No, I think that's it. I'm sure there's something I'm not thinking of, but that's basically what's going on right now. Okay. And so, yeah, if anybody wants to come to the conference to meet Eric in person and, and hear his presentations and there's going to be a handful of presentations that's going to be pretty mind-blowing. Um, there's going to be, you know, I think, a pretty heavy focus on the ether, including some uh, interferometer experiments that show um, positive results and some other people. Uh, one person, um, I haven't mentioned who the name is yet, but there are 
secret uh, special guest will be giving two presentations, and uh, it's going to be a pretty exciting conference. Um, so if you go to energiscienceconference.com, you can register and um, uh, get your tickets. I only opened up for payments early uh, February last month, a little over a month ago, and already about 40-something percent of the seats are sold out. So there's only 80-something seats left. Uh, so if you do want to come, uh, this conference sells out every year and uh, usually one to two and a half months ahead of the conference. And so if you want to come, uh, I'd encourage everybody to register, get your tickets right away to make sure you get a seat locked in. Um, also, for you know a list of all of Eric's presentations, you can find them at ericpdollar.com um, or you can go to emediapress.com and you can just scroll down and you can just hit control F on the browser and just type in dollard and just go one right after another and that'll just bring you down to all, all the different presentations from the different conferences, um, including some of the, uh, uh, the books. Um, so yeah, if you want to ask a question, uh, everybody's muted out right now. Um, and if you have a question for Eric, hit five star. I'll put a little uh, sign next to your phone number and I can unmute you. Um, I think the first person who did that, your number is ending in 6702. I'm going to um, unmute you right now if you want to go ahead and ask your uh, – if you can uh, introduce yourself, say your name, where you're from, and uh, go ahead and ask your question. Hello, Eric? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, um, I'm Winston from San Bernardino, California. Now I just wanted to ask, um, Eric, you mentioned what impulse electricity is in a few presentations, or I think just one, but what exactly is impulse electricity? Okay, can you repeat that, Aaron? I didn't quite get the, the words. Yeah, if you, if you can define what pulse pulsed electricity is. Impul impulse. Impulse, well, impulse, wave, impulse wave is a transient that, that comes and goes without any type of oscillation or periodic, periodic waveform or continuum. It's just there and then it's gone. Okay. And um, regarding the Tesla magnifying transformer, you said that the primary must equal the amount of copper within the secondary, but for above 2 megahertz, it's the surface area that matters and the volume is regards to lower frequencies. Is that true, or is there some consideration? Well, it's what's called the skin effect. So as you get higher in frequency, uh, less of the metal takes part in the process. So, so if you have a real thick metal bar, it doesn't really conduct it in the way that you would think at a high frequency. The electricity is confined to the surface. So you have to take that into consideration. So once you get up above around three megacycles, the depth of penetration is less than a thousandth of an inch. So you have to deal more with surface areas than you do with, with volumes when you get to that high of frequency. Okay. And the spacing of the secondary also with high frequency, I've calculated that the spacing between the wires is very small. So would it be possible to use insulated wire where that the insulation occupies the spacing? Yeah, it's not a good idea to do that. That increases the capacitance. Okay. And in general, the, the best spacing for coils is usually the space between the wires is a little bit larger than their diameter. Mm -hmm. If you start getting them too close together, then that aggravates the skin effect, it increases the capacitance, and if you get them too far apart, then they don't couple together well and you have more radiation losses. So the standard uh, rule of thumb for, for making radio frequency transformers is that the, space, the spacing of the conductors center to center should be about 60 some odd percent of the diameter of the wire. Okay. And the grounding for such an apparatus, is it depth or is it the entire surface area of the grounding apparatus what matters, or is it both? Oh, well, it's kind of complicated because you're trying to get into the earth. So 
that's not easy to do because if you have a rod, that's not really into the earth. That's just into a little part of the earth. So you have to have, like, tree roots. For okay. example, the, the Wardenclyffe uh, project that Tesla put together has roots that go 100 feet into the ground and, and 300 feet in diameter around that a massive root system like you would find on a, on a tree. Otherwise, you have to spread it out over the surface like they do with the radio station is they have wires slightly buried in the ground, 120 of them, that are at least the height of the tower. And oh, okay. that's an optimum way to ground the thing without having to do a lot of excavation into the interior of the earth, which is not practical in a lot of cases. So, so one way to do it is to have rings of, like, ground rods where the spacing between the ground rods is twice their length and then radial wires going out to those ground rods. That's usually the first step in, in producing a ground system. Uh, the problem is, is, the, is the impedance of the ground has to be only about 1% of the neutral impedance on the Tesla transformer, and that's pretty small. That's like a fraction of an ohm. So either you've got to spread it out over an infinite surface, or you have to have a very intimate contact with the interior of the Earth on a conductive level. Okay. And the, um, the wire for the secondary, what do you recommend? Because I've heard that you used um, Teflon silver-coated wire, something along that. Or yeah, coax, you... because then the skin effect is not a problem because you're just dealing with the outer, outer shield. Uh, but again, that depends on frequency. So the three megacycles, and at least in Navy engineering, is considered the cutoff point where Litz wire doesn't really accomplish much anymore, nor braiding or any of that, and you're dealing with metal surfaces. And if you get below 50 kilocycles, then then the depth of penetration is such you can start using wires without worrying about the skin effect. But most people seem to be operating these things somewhere around the broadcast band. So you're getting close to the border there. Uh, so the, the Colorado Springs model that's being constructed now uses Litz wire in the secondary. And by account of the, um, of the radio engineer books from the wireless days when all this stuff was going on, uh, Litz wire will double the, double the magnification factor of the coil, which is a rather substantial improvement. Okay. Well, thank you, Eric. Thank you for answering my question. Okay. Thanks, Winston. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and meet you out, but if you have another question, just feel free to hit five star again. Okay, next person who had a question, um, your number is ending in 2103. I'm going to uh, go ahead and unmute you if you can introduce yourself, say your name, where you're from, and go ahead and ask your question. Hi, uh, Aaron and uh, Professor Dollar. This is uh, Dan. I'm calling from Ontario, Canada. I was actually one of the, uh, one of the engineering students who, who luckily won a ticket uh, to attend the conference a few years back. I uh, just have a few questions. I'll go through them as quick as I can. Um, and Aaron, if you want to jump in at any time, you can do so. Uh, so first okay. off, Thanks, Eric, uh, just wondering, can you <clears throat> wondering what, what your thoughts on combining uh, trans transistor like digital type circuits with analog Tesla or, or Steinmetz ideas to, to pr produce any useful circuits? No, I'm pretty much opposed to anything digital. Right, because it right. It doesn't fit. <laughs> that's, that's part of what's going wrong right now is digital. Digital is what's right. producing all of these disruptive waveforms that are infecting the power grid and the power companies rewiring the power grid to increase the efficiency of their infection. Right. And, that, and that, does that have to do with the harmonics that are naturally present? Yeah, harmonics and parasitic oscillations. Okay. Okay. For example, uh, I only ask. Um, right. For example, when I park my car and try to listen to the AM radio at the parking lot of the coffee shop, they have put in these wretched LED lights. And uh, uh -huh. normally I park away from there to get away from all the interference, but 
I had to park in the parking lot because somebody was going to meet me. And uh, the thing sounded like a spark gap Tesla transmitter. And by making some estimates with the instrumentation in my car, that half of the electrical energy consumed is involved in lighting the luminary, and the other half exists as a broadcast band parasitic oscillation in the transmission line going from the panel board into the building out to the street light. So, so every one of these things incrementally is adding power to this massive wave of interference that's getting stronger and stronger every year. And it's mm -hmm. not an intrinsic problem with the LEDs itself. It's that they're using digital technology to convert the uh, line voltage to the LED voltage because they don't want to spend money on transformers or other things. So they're using the switching right. technology. And then what that does is that excites the feed line to the light fixture and puts it into a quarter wave resonance, and its length is that of a wavelength of the broadcast band, and consequently, you cannot use your AM radio. Now, if they were to use transformers and rectifiers and what have you, then uh, that wouldn't have been a problem, but, but that costs money, and these businesses are not in the spending money, they're just in the taking your money. So that's one example of digital. Uh, another digital example is I uh, have the experience of uh, staying in somebody's house and they have something made by some company called Life is Good. As soon as I hear that, I'm suspect. There's nothing good about life. <laughs> From birth to the grave, it's a horrifying experience, sickening. And uh, but at any rate, I'm sleeping in this room next to this thing and it's going through all these gyrations and tormenting me all night with this convulsive sounds and speeding up and slowing down, and I learned that the thing is controlled digitally. So when we were trying to find a wire for these high-voltage, high-frequency projects like the MWO and the magnifying transformer and all that type of stuff, I learned that uh, what the digital is doing is it's because it's switching, it's producing Tesla transients in the inductance in the motor windings and burning out the insulation, so now they have to use a high voltage winding to contain the high frequency oscillations, but who wants those high frequency oscillations in their house to begin with? You can't listen right. to the radio anymore and it gnaws away at, at the electrical environment around you and stresses all your other apparatus. But that's the way it operates because digital right. is a totalitarian mind state and it is absolutely intent on destroying anything that is not digital. Right, and and Ellie asked this because, um, from my understanding, from from the SERPs and, and the work Jim Murray and, and Paul Babcock have done, and Aaron, you can jump in if if I misrepresent this at all. But I believe they use, I don't know if they use the transistor circuits to kind of, to kind of, kind of have the generator. Um, switch at certain points that would reduce the the counter EMF of self-induction to be less than 90 degrees. And I know, I know Steinmetz also uh, mentioned about, uh, in his oscillating currents uh, chapter, he talked about the negative energy components of, uh, of the reactants in oscillating circuits. So I just wanted to hear your take on if that is possible, is, is it feasible through some other method and if any of Tesla's technologies also incorporated that kind of negative energy components of the oscillating current uh, reactants. Well, that's what makes the, the magnifying transformer magnify, is the energy accumulates in the field and it's timed in such a way that it can't escape. And uh, every cycle it builds up stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, the, the problem with the burning out motor windings that I just talked about is because you, the electronics people and Einstein philosophy in general says there's no electric field, so they ignore it, but nevertheless they're switching that winding on and off at, a, at an inopportune time, and that magnetic energy needs to escape when the circuit's open, so it produces a, um, not a back EMF, it produces a forward EMF. This is the thing that 
that all these people, the back EMF parrots, have really turned this thing inside out. Something that's made me quite angry. The parrot talk, back EMF, back EMF. Well, it's backwards and there's forwards EMF. So when you break the circuit, right. that's the negative energy co uh, component, is then the magnetic energy can no longer remain in, in the inductance because there's no path for current flow. And current flow and magnetism are the same thing, so it generates a forward EMF to try to maintain the current flow, and mm -hmm. that produces an electrostatic potential, which in turn charges the windings of the capacitance, and then that jumps back into the magnetism, and that's how you get these violent oscillations. So the Steinmetz oscillating currents chapter gets into the whole mathematical theory of that in the transient book and in the AC book it gets kind of more into a kind of a generalized way of thinking about it uh, that's uh, the best one of course would be the first edition of the AC book because Steinmetz was still more of a thinker then rather than trying to come up with concrete engineering formula right yeah I just I just find it kind of fascinating I don't I don't think I've read um pretty much anywhere else that kind of the special properties of oscillating currents and I thought that chapter by Steinmetz was, was pretty uh, pretty revealing. Um, just wanted to go on to some other questions. I know you mentioned the Crystal Radio Initiative as an excellent uh, kind of work project and, and I am planning to do that um, over the summer, hopefully when the weather is uh, better, but I'm just wondering if you had any other sort of basic projects that, that maybe one could attempt um, at home or, or just just trying to balance the, the practical side with the theoretical side that, that I'm I studying. put a lot of that stuff on the energetic forum back in the days when I had a way to, to directly interact with that. There was various little projects like radiation detectors and pulse modulators and, and what have you, and then a lot of other people were contributing their ideas. And that's oh, probably okay. a good place to find, you know, various types of experiments to do. Yeah, 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 I'll, I'll take a look for sure. And then Another the, thing, the final you know, question. Just, just get an old 1960s, 50s to 60s radio amateur handbook and just build some of the little receivers and transmitters that they have in there. That's how I learned when I was a child. Mm -hmm. Mm, okay. That'll give okay, you a, a good, yeah. uh, a good basic, uh, a basic experience in dealing with coils and capacitors and vacuum tubes and what have you. Yeah. And of course, it's always awesome. you know, good to get a uh, an amateur radio license so that you can actually legally transmit with this stuff on the air. Right. Right. <laughs> that's something that people are missing the point when they think they're doing these Wardenclyffe. Uh, duplications and what have you is now they're transmitting and they're not acknowledging the fact that what they transmit might be interfering with somebody else and there's legalities you know that uh, that show up in that type of situation and you can really get yourself in big time trouble with this stuff if you're not careful yeah yeah yeah, yeah. particularly being you know that this new digital technology is so susceptible to these type of uh, impulses that you know one screw up and you can end up wiping out the internet in an entire town. Yeah, yeah. So someone's going to end up getting everybody in trouble if they don't uh, watch where they're going with this stuff. It's not a toy. Right, right. And then the uh, final qu question, and this is both for you and Aaron, if you guys want to comment. Um, sort of unrelated, but I just I just noticed that, you know, kind of being in the electrical sciences, demands like a certain level of um, discipline and, and certain sort of balance in, in your mind state. So I just wonder if you could comment on, on how you how you stay disciplined, how you kind of work at that mentality, and uh, how you kind of balance your work with theoretical work with practical work and, and kind of being in nature that, that you talked about last time in your, in your uh, call. Well, I don't know how to describe that. That's kind of like asking a coyote why it eats chickens. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I do. So it's just yeah. it takes its own course. You know, it depends where I park my car or what the weather's doing or who's bothering me or what parts I have on hand or, you know, it's uh, it's like being in a sailboat out in the ocean. 
Right, right, yeah, yeah. Well, but see, initially I was, I was strictly practically orientated on, on a purely experimental basis. With Bell Telephone and RCA and Pacific Gas and Electric as my sponsors, so to speak, and then when the the big uh, when the carpetbaggers showed up and there was the big readjustment and everything got bulldozed, the only thing left was mathematics. So I went that route, and that was actually very helpful because there's a lot of things that I needed to learn. And then right. then sometimes some money shows up, and then I can get back into the practical stuff, and then. Thereafter, the bulldozers show up and destroy every bit of it, and then it's back to the math again, and then I get some money and some help, and I build something, and then the bulldozers show up, and it's all destroyed, and I go back to the math, and uh, I have no, con no personal control over it. But I would, I would much rather be building things than fooling around with equations, but the fooling around with equations has taught me so much that now I can build better things. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, that, that was basically it for my questions. I just want to thank you guys for having these calls and uh, the, the work you're doing. Really appreciate it. Okay, you're welcome. All right, thanks, Dan. Bye. Okay, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and unmute somebody else here, um, lowering your hand, and I'm unmuting you. If you can go ahead and introduce yourself, uh, your name, where you're from, and go ahead and ask your question. Uh, hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Hey, Aaron, and hey, Professor Eric. My name is Ennis. I called uh, last time. Um, I have two very um, uh, two questions actually. One is a clarification of my understanding with regards to uh, the versions, and then the other is a follow up based on whether or not I understood um, the previous summary that I'm about to provide the above, uh, in the above. So, um, after going through the derivations many times over and over again, because I wanted to actually understand this visually of what the derivation is actually doing. Um, my summary is, uh, of what I've understood so far is that it's possible to derive the set of electrical waves and their versa positions belonging to a system of n phases using the exponential infinite series raised to a complex power or a hyper logarithm as a basis for the derivation. And uh, this is possible because the set of electrical waves present in the n phase system leave a footprint of their individual phase pattern as well as the overall sequence of the system through those phases in the terms of the exponential infinite series when raised to the relevant complex power and expanded. So from my understanding, therefore, not only do the terms of the expanded infinite series represent the overall sequence through those electrical waves which occur in that system of n phases, but when the expanded infinite series is factored appropriately, one can also extract the phase pattern for each kind of electrical wave present in that system, as well as the function for the overall sequence of the system. Is that correct? Yes. Wow. It's called the, uh, that's Fortescue's uh, method of symmetrical coordinate systems. It, it's something, it's so hard to take in because it's, so, it's just insane how just taking the infinite series and substituting the hyper logarithm, and all of a sudden you get this pattern that represents like a, a, a sequence that before wasn't just realized. And it just, it's something that is insanely mind blowing. I've, I've, I've just come to this realization after reading the derivation several times. So I'm very glad that um, that has been confirmed for me. And uh, I'm just uh, like, how, how did you? What was the first step or intuition that you got uh, for you to have uh, used the hyper logarithm in order to reveal this the sequence of things? Like, uh, from uh, two papers written by Dr. Alexander McFarlane in the 19th century. One's called the uh, Imaginary of Algebra. Right, right. I remember that one. And the other one is called The Principles of Algebra of Physics. And then Steinmetz's alternating current book uh, laid the groundwork for it. And then when I was in high school, I learned um, what's called uh, the symmetrical components method of, of polyphase analysis. And that had always stuck in my mind. And I had direct hands-on experience with that out at RCA because they have their own substation and et cetera. Those things had to be... You have to know about that kind of stuff. And um, then uh, it was actually Philo Farnsworth III kind of got me started on, on quantifying this stuff, and, th and that's what led me to the McFarland. And then, uh, and then I wrote two papers a long, long time ago on, uh, on my viewpoint that I arrived at from studying the works of McFarland. One's called the symbolic representation of the alternating electric wave, and the other one is called 
the symbolic representation of the generalized electric wave. I don't know if you saw those or not, but that was kind of my start in all this was to was to come up with these imaginary logarithms. Uh, Farnsworth gave me a book from his father called The Principles. What was it? It's uh, Physics and Mathematics in Electrical Communication by a guy named Perrine, if I remember right. And what a gold mine that was. So why, why didn't they teach us this in high school? Why, it was so easy to understand. Why don't they teach this in school? So one of my first uh, video presentations at the San Francisco Tesla Society got into all these various little unknown avenues of electrical theory. I think it was called the uh, History and Theory of Electricity. It had several names. The nickname is called Explosion in the Shipyard. <laughs> It's very fascinating, and truly, I, I am very thankful for the time that you've taken to uh, derive this math, and uh, I am still at shock as to why uh, this isn't some kind of a Nobel Prize situation, because it's really allowed me to actually visualize what's going on, and um, especially one of the key uh, parts that made me really understand it was the idea of rotation, and how um, when you're going from the alternating sequence, that's not considered a rotation, but when you have um, the dual binary, as you say, like the J and the minus J, that allows the the quarter period to happen, and then the half period, which is what allows for that kind of rotation, from what I understood based on the sequences. Um, so um, uh, that was the clarification for the first part. Now, the second part is basically me uh, going, uh, following the same line of reasoning. Um, and so in the system of multiple coordinates lectures, you walk through an example of a telephone pair where the whole goal was to have the system let only the self-induction propagate and not the mutual inductance because that's what allows for the crosstalk. And uh, what you do is you demonstrate that you c uh, one can build an analog network such that the component of the waves belonging to the mutual inductance are balanced out or is phase shifted out to zero at the end of the cycle, leaving only the self-induction. But this is all in time. So if someone's goal, for example, had to do with, uh, let's say, neutralizing the idea of weight, which is an operation in space, um, it appears to me that the process of wanting to be done is very similar, as in the archetype of the solution is the same, um, given that the whole idea of weight, according to J.J. Thompson and Walter Russell, is that there is essentially an interaction of potentials in space between the body and the environment, and an unbalance between them manifests as a resulting force or weight. So in essence, the signal of our body or potential and the environment has a crosstalk, a mutual induction of sorts. And what, what, what one would need to do is create a network of sorts that kind of phase shifts the waves in the space exactly analogous to the phase shifting of the waves in the telephone cable so that their mutual induction, just like the mutual induction in the telephone cable, is balanced out, so to speak, at the end of the cycle. And that way we would have no potential interaction with the environment. Um, we would only have the self-induction, thus canceling our potential relative to the environment and canceling the weight. Is that, is that a valid line of reasoning based on um, what I've understood? Uh, that's conceivable. Interesting. It's so, still, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the whole thing about gravity is still kind of indeterminate, but um, right. so, I mean, there's nothing that can be said definite about it. Right. But nevertheless, you know, the principles are still, you know, force and there's still a field, so to speak. Right. And, and if you do not believe in action at distance, then there has to be a medium to convey the action. And uh, in general, it's, um, the electrostatics and, and gravity have always seemed to have had some kind of kinship, but, and some people have gotten results. There was a guy who gave a presentation last year that was doing it with electromagnetic wave interference, but you know, nothing was physically demonstrated, but but it did sound interesting, and apparently there was a lot of work done in that area. It's kind of, it's kind of outside of, of my my realm, so right. I can't right. I can't say one thing or another, but right. I've learned a lot I'm, in you know once I got some concrete uh, equations for you know what are the electrical forces on conductors in a transmission system, something you won't find in any textbook, any book at all, as a matter of fact. But it turns out to be that Steinmetz wrote one little paper and presented it to the AIEE back in his day, and, uh, and the whole thing was solved. Yet it's, it does, does not appear in any engineering book. And I found that by using the forces in a complex electrical system, uh, you can arrive at, at solutions of complex waves a lot easier than you can by trying to fool around with Maxwell's equations or... Maxwell's equations basically, you know, are, are a ritual. 
that's all, that's all it really is. They, they don't provide any solution. The people that propounded Maxwell's equations, as you'll see in the thing that Aaron just put on the website, uh, mm -hmm. said they really couldn't make any sense out of it. They had to, to make their own interpretations. Helmholtz's equations were thoroughly ignored. Uh, both Maxwell's equations, as he wrote them, and Helmholtz's equations have no solution. So they're basically philosophical works that have absolutely no practical value. And if it wasn't people like for people like for Hertz and Heaviside, uh, we wouldn't have got anything out of it at all. It's mm -hmm. strictly uh, mathematical entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why I was asking was because uh, I was actually reading the book of a man who did present in the conference. I believe it was last year, the, the year before that. Um, it's um, it's called Gravity Control, and it was written by um, Doctor. Well, it was written by his son, but the the gentleman responsible for the whole concept is uh, Doctor Frederick Alzavon. And basically, his whole idea is that he solves, or at least he he, cre he he has some kind of model or theory that kind of runs along the same lines of how J.J. Thompson conceived of weight. And uh, essentially, he has an experiment in which he neutralizes a sample's weight using a waveguide situation. And that's why I was asking this particular question, because the whole waveguide idea is, 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 is in space. And so what I was thinking was um, basically, you know, using the waveguide, it could be that network, so to speak, that could kind of phase out that mutual induction. And then, you know, bam, you wouldn't have weight, uh, or at least it would be decreasing. So I was just kind of um, following up on that. But I know there's still lots of development in that regard because we don't even have a space algebra. So, I mean, um, I just wanted to confirm that theoretically. Yeah, but it, like I say, it, it is hmm. theory. I, I don't know how to engineer it. Mm -hmm. This guy did with the waveguides, but then, you know, there's nothing really quantitative to grab a hold of there. It's just right. somebody did this, and okay, mm -hmm. well, they did it, but then uh, I, I tend to dismiss most things until I actually see a, a physical result or a theory that, you know, that can be reduced to an algebraic level right. and experimented with. Otherwise, you know, I'll just, I'll just get lost in fairyland. I've, I've got to keep, you know, on track, which is kind of hard when i got two or three different, you know, things going at once like I do right. now. You know, I'm, I'm writing on the last presentation on, you know, basic hypotheses of electricity and how to apply them to engineering and then you know, the Colorado Springs model, uh, that was 100 pages of arithmetic to arrive at that, by the way. And, uh, and wow. also, you know, the seismic thing, I've got to keep that cooking in the back of my mind. And then I've got my own projects of, you know, keeping my own stuff going and, and what have you. And uh, so I can't, I can't really get into too much more. Right. I've got to stick to you know, what, what's going to provide me with an end result. Mm -hmm. And all of it is kind of off of what I really want to be doing, and that's building this, you know, this telluric system and the musical seismograph and the cosmic induction generator with all this stuff that I have piled up around me here that I can't really do anything with right now because i got no way to organize it and I don't have any help. But, mm -hmm. uh, but it is fortunate that I do have all the materials. Well, I'm very thankful that uh, you do have the resources necessary to still to continue. I've definitely benefited um, from your work, you know, in the manner that I cannot even begin to quantify. And I just wanted to say one more time that I do appreciate the time um, and, and your presence in this call, and uh, that'll be it for now. Thank you so much, and thank you, Aaron, for uh, helping uh, establish this transmission. Sure. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, thanks, Anna. Uh Let's see. Yeah, anybody interested in that gravity control stuff, it's uh, gravitycontrol.io. Um, that was uh, uh, David Alzafon last year uh, presenting on his father, Dr. Frederick Alzafon's work, who was a uh, personal student of Oppenheimer and Bohm and some of these other, I guess you would say, kind of the fathers of the atomic age or whatever. Um, but got Frederick, uh, Dr. Frederick Alzafon was an engineer at Boeing and Lockheed and developed some type of uh, anti-gravity method that David uh, covered um, which is also in his book of the same title. But if you go to gravitycontrol.io, you can find all that, uh, all the information on that for uh, presentations and books. Um, let's see. We have uh, James in uh, San Francisco. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you if you want to go ahead and uh, answer your question or ask your question. And if anybody else has a question for Eric, just hit five star, and that will put a little symbol up next to your phone number so I know that you want to ask a question. Okay, go ahead, go ahead James. 
Hi, guys. Um, well, I kind of have an anecdotal little piece that may confirm the electrical chaos situation that we're kind of going getting into. Um, kind of relates the digital and the analog quandary or conflict. Um, so I'm just going to tell my little story real quick. So I'm driving up the 101 here in California, Northern, and I got this little tape player, this little Jensen handheld cassette player to play my old Grateful Dead tapes. And uh, this is the first time I'm using it in my car. And as soon as I got on the freeway, I started hearing uh, what sounded like Wi-Fi. Or back in the 90s when the Internet was real young, when you first log on, you'd get this dial-up tone, and, and, and it kind of reminded me of that. And, and I looked up, and I looked to the left or to the right, and I saw a big cell phone tra tower, wireless transmitter. And uh confused me as to why I was hearing it through, through the speakers of my car. And so I continued driving up the 101, and uh, I was able to point these transmitters out because I could hear myself approaching them. It kind of sounded uh, like an ether wind almost. If I were to blow air into the microphone of the of the telephone right now, it kind of sound like, um, along with some buzzes and beeps, it, that's the kind of thing I was hearing. And uh, I noticed, um, well, actually, the, the second time I tried doing this to show somebody, you're like, hey, uh, I don't want to be the only one who, who realizes that something weird's here happening here. So I tried to show my brother, and it wasn't happening. And so I did some exp some little experimentation, and I found that when my phone battery was in my phone, and my phone was powered on, this noise was non-existent, as if my phone was picking it up and keeping it from going through the speakers, but when my phone was unplugged and the, and the battery was taken out, that's when I would hear it through the, through the tape player, I guess, and what actually ended up happening is uh, it was damaging my tapes, and when I... I ended up pulling up to uh, getting off the freeway on Fremont Avenue, and there's a big, giant transmitter there for cell phones. And uh, as I pulled up to the stoplight, I had to stop right in front of this thing, and my tape slowed down, slowed down, just stopped. And uh, so I lost that priceless Grateful Dead tape. And I believe to cell phone towers. And so that's my story. Hopefully, Eric, I maybe, you know, shine some light on what's going on there. Thanks. Thank yeah, you. it's just pure it's just pure overload. There's so so much power coming out of these these communication sites that uh it's just overriding the transistors in your in your tape player. I used to have that problem in the Navy. Is even though my stereo was turned turned off, could even be unplugged when the big uh, SPS 39 search radar would sweep by the barracks. I'd hear the, the pulse modulator come out of the speakers because the the power is so high that it just self rectifies in all the semiconductor junctions. So. That was back then. The Navy corrected that immediately, but nobody, the Navy, I think, still cares. But these communications companies, they, they could give a damn. There's quite a war broke out that in Bolinas when they put in a uh, so-called cellular telephone tower, which, according to my spectrum analyzers, was putting out all kinds of other things, too, that weren't even legal. And then when they found out that, uh, that I was receiving this stuff, that led to the installation being destroyed by the SWAT team. Uh, which kind of left me with an attitude. But um, but the stuff's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Steve McGreevy built a specialized device using a radar mixer diode, 
in one of his high-gain amplifiers that he uses for earth signal listening and drove around in Owens Valley there where Lone Pine is. This thing has no amplifiers in it whatsoever on the RF side. It operates on direct detection. So it's, in other words, it's receiving electricity and then delivering the pulses of those electricity to the audio amplifier, which makes them come out of the speaker. And there wasn't a place in Owens Valley that you could get away from this stuff. So the flux density is gradually increasing as time goes on, and the wavelengths are getting shorter and shorter, which makes that flux density more penetrating into the cellular activity of the human body. So basically all of this with the power lines and the communications and the digital and all of that is kind of subtly exterminating the human race just so that somebody can make some money today who doesn't care about tomorrow. Meanwhile, we're uh, inundated with all these falsehoods like climate change and global warming and whatever as a distraction, when in reality it's radio frequencies that are the most destructive thing to the human species right now. Yeah, I, I have to agree. Uh, I'm, I'm probably more worried about what's coming out of the cell phone tower across the street from my house than the ice melting or whatever that is going on on the news, whatever Trump is, whatever. And so one quick question that's totally related. Um, you mentioned Steve McGreevy uh, has some custom receiver for this kind of thing. And uh, I started building the, the free one he's got online. I just never finished it. It's called the, the, B, the Triple B4 the basic bare bones number four and uh, I wish I had it so I wouldn't have to ask this question but um, do you know or Aaron possibly if uh, the basic bare bones unit will pick this stuff up because I'm curious about having something to sense this you have, radiation. You, have to have a, you have to have a microwave detector diode in association with it Okay, that's the kind of information I'm looking for. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. All right. You, you have any other questions, James? Or um, well, that, that, that's about it. I'm going to do some research and, and maybe contact Steve McGreevy. I'm interested in building something or maybe purchasing something to to uh, bring this invisible radiation to my awareness. Thanks. Yeah, and there's different, there's different meters you can buy, too, more specific to those purposes. Um, I'm not sure about one called maybe the Trifield meter, and yeah, there's you another you gotta company. You've got to watch out for those. They tend to pick up everything. It's, re it's really better to use an audio output because then it's something you can relate to. You know, whether it's like power line hum or, you know, digital signals or radar pulses, those, those meters are, they're very, very, very misleading. Yeah, I mean, the, just to see numbers on a screen, it doesn't really compare to what McGreevy could offer with the audio, yeah. Yeah, so it's, this is not something I tried to get him to, to commercialize it, but, it, you know, it's more complication than than he could handle because he's doing all this stuff by himself. So whatever he produces, you know, already in the, in the voice frequency band is consumes a lot of his time. But he did assemble this thing, and, uh, you know, I kind of gave him the instructions. And if you're able to communicate with him, he can send you a diagram. Yeah, I'm going to give it a shot. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thanks, James. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, Winston, uh, before I unmute you here real quick, um, Eric, you know, recently I sent you Ernest, er, Ernest's um, book. I think it's called a Tesla's Magnifying Transmitter uh, Recreating Tesla's Dream. And you had a chance to look through that, and you had mentioned that there might, might be a couple things he might be showing that somebody else or uh, nobody else has. Um, do you want to maybe kind of mention some of the things that you saw in that book that might be of interest, or would you rather wait until you talk to Ernest here in about an hour? Well, the two things that attracted my attention in there, well, actually, it's three things. One of them is a negative. Uh, 
He claims that he was able to detect the echo of sending a pulse into the earth and receiving it back. Uh, I'm not certain of that, but um, but that's what I need to ask him about is, is how he determined that. Uh, I haven't heard, heard or, of anybody doing that before. He also claimed that it took a while for this thing to build up, and then even if you turned it off, it seemed like the buildup still hung around. Uh, Tesla had made some mention of these kind of things, and then if you left it off for a long time, then you'd have to kind of warm it back up again. Uh, it's kind of hard to pinpoint any of these things scientifically without, you know, extensive measurements and what have you. It could just simply be the things heating up the ground or there's some kind of environmental situation. Um, there's some information that has been presented recently that I am in disagreement with, is that the elevated capacity on the Wardenclyffe Tower was grounded. Uh, that makes no sense. Uh, Tesla did draw some diagrams and talk about using radio frequency chokes to support the tower, to take the dielectric stresses off of the tower itself. Um, that would have to be some rather fancy coils. Uh, straight wires will not do it. Straight wires will act like broadcast station towers, and you'll lose all your electricity electromagnetically. So uh, this book claims that the tower has to be grounded. Uh, the basis for all this is just a few scraps of paper that Leland Anderson found in the Tesla Museum. And uh, I uh, warn people, as with Lukowski and the Rife stuff, is to not take anything as, uh, as a fact that you see some experimenter did. Maybe he made some tube or wound some coil. That could have turned out to have been totally wrong after the next experiment. Uh, my advice is, is to stop at the Colorado Springs level because that's documented enough where it's, it's able to be analyzed and, and work from that point on. So uh, it seems to be a lot of people are fooling around with these so-called Wardenclyffe reenactments, even though some people are claiming that it's something else. Uh, this is going to start causing a massive amount of interference and could lead to a government intervention, like what happened with the Navy back in World War I, where all of a sudden all of it is outlawed because people don't know how to behave responsibly. It always ends up screwing everything up for everybody else. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at on all of that. And, er and you mentioned that he kind of starts off also with um, disagreeing that the Zenic wave deal has anything to do with it, um, which you're in agreement with as well? Yeah, yeah. The, the Zenic wave is an electromagnetic form of wave. Uh, Tesla says again and again and again and again and again that his waves are not electromagnetic. Uh, Tesla uh, vehemently states that Maxwell was going in the wrong direction. So when and then there's the Tom Bearden scalar wave garbage, which comes out of that archaic mathematics that turned out to be a failure called vector and scalar potentials, which these people still cling to. So we have scalar waves, we have Maxwell's equations, and we have Zenic waves. And there is nothing to do with Tesla in any of that whatsoever. So the main value I got out of that booklet that you mentioned was, was the time was taken to extract all of the Tesla quotes that where Tesla states these things again and again, which will help me in my presentation because I have all this stuff now, one nice convenient little pamphlet, and I don't have to go hunt on the Internet for all these articles. So that helped a lot and, uh, and actually helped with my understanding of what Tesla was after because I, really, I have not read that stuff since all the way back in the 70s when I first got started on this. So there's a lot of things I needed clarified in my head. So the booklet is excellent in that regard, but, but the conclusions that are come to are a little hastily arrived at. But it is encouraging to see you know, that somebody has taken the effort to uh, try to deal with this, at least on a partially scientific level. 
Yeah, so if anybody wants to get a copy of that book, you can go to emediapress.com, and in the left column, you'll see titles of the last handful of uh, blog posts, um, or you can just scroll down, you know, one page after another uh, to find it. Um, but it's uh, his name is Ernst, and uh, the book is Tesla's Magnifying Transmitter, Recreating Tesla's Dream. Um, I also posted on Eric's website uh, because of the mention that Eric has uh, read that book, and he'll be communicating with uh, Ernst shortly, just to kind of, uh, you know, chat and learn more about his work and, and that kind of deal. So anyway, um, and all the quotes and everything Eric is talking about is in that book. Uh, so definitely get a copy, and, you know, it's always good to support somebody who's, you know, sharing their work like this. Um, uh, let's see, Winston, I'm going to um, unmute you here. Go ahead and uh, ask your question. Oh, hi, Eric. I forgot to ask you in the first part. Um, if we take a telegraph line or a antenna, there's a certain burden factor because of the insulators. How would you derive the burden? Uh, that's next to, next to impossible. Okay. It's best to arrive at it experimentally. And how would you approach that? Well, you need to know the dielectric constant of the materials that you're using, for one. So you want to use structural material that has the lowest dielectric constant possible. And you want to uh, uh, pretty much minimize any of that because just the presence of an insulating body even near the Tesla transformer will detune it. Okay. So you can you can try to derive a formula or an equation to get an idea of what that burden is going to be, but that can really get quite complicated. So at that point, it's better just to build something and then see how far it off it is from from the theoretical uh, value of the frequency. There's other factors that that burden it too. One is is not having a perfect ground. The other one is is having some kind of uh, gradient control so sparks don't jump off the end of it. That burdens it greatly. So there's quite a few factors involved, and it really has to be arrived at experimentally. Okay. Um, thank you. That will be all. Okay. Thanks, Winston. Uh, let's see. Does anybody ha else have any questions? Um, if you do, hit five star, and I'll be able to tell you have a a question for Eric. Otherwise, I guess we can um, go ahead and wrap it up. Okay, yeah, if your number ends in 4638, you're already unmuted. Um, go ahead and introduce yourself, where you're from, and go ahead and ask your questions. Yeah. Hi, Aaron. Uh, Bruce Gavin. You oh, hey, Bruce. didn't recognize my telephone number because I'm on the landline. <clears throat> but uh, nevertheless, um, I thought I'd chime in here just briefly uh, for everyone okay. listening. Okay. I'm uh, I'm the one who's working, assisting Eric to build the scale models of the Colorado Springs uh, magnifying transmitter. And what I'm doing is actually building two, that is a pair of uh, the scale models that are uh, one twentieth of the full-sized uh, unit that existed in Colorado in 1899. And uh, it, up to this point, a lot of calculations have been done. Eric's worked on this with me and provided me with a lot of numbers and dimensions. And, and we've worked out details of materials uh, that we can use, um, some of them compromises uh, because of expense and whatnot. But uh, uh, it was more, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, majority of the materials now uh, are on site here at my place. Um, so I'll give you a list of the materials that are all raw materials and everything is being fabricated uh, to, to the specific dimensions and uh, plan. That we, we're using plywood. We're using fiberglass epoxy. <laughs> we're using G10 fiberglass sheet, rod, Teflon sheets, and blocks, Litz wire, magnet wire, hand-spun copper hoods, aluminum spheres, and copper tubing, 
and um, to, to, to name the, the majority of them anyway. So um, work is underway now, and uh, we'll be continuing to try to get this thing done as soon as possible. A prototype extra coil has been built and tested pretty good results. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the final uh, manifestation of that prototype will be built. And then the primary and secondary windings will be built as well. And there was some discussion earlier about wire. Well, we're using uh, Litz wire in the secondary. Uh, and we're using magnet wire with that special insulation that Eric was talking about earlier that, that helps to uh, prevent from the uh, transient bursts that p puncture the insulation. So we've got the best that we can get uh, for, the, for the extra coil. That's very small wire. That's 20-gauge wire that we're winding on there, 100 turns of it almost, on the, on the um, extra coil. So uh, I just thought I'd chime in, you guys, and uh, give you an update so you know that things are, are happening. I'm taking photographs as I go, so the plan is to get some of the pictures up uh, on Eric's website as soon as we can. Okay, Aaron, back to you. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Glad, glad you got my text. <laughs> I did, thank you. I was aware of it, too. So, but right, right. Appreciate the okay, great. Hey, and uh, if you get a chance to, um, I think you might have emailed it in the past, the exact magnet wire you're using with that, um, I don't know if it's capped on or whatever other kind of coding, um, but if you could let me know exactly what the magnet wire um, you have is. Uh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll look forward to that. Thank out, you. It turns out that the capped on can only be put on larger size diameter wires because it's like a, a sheet. It's like a, you know, a foil kind of. Uh, material that can't be wrapped around the very small diameter wires, but I'll get you the information. Okay, okay great. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Yep. We'll see. You. All right. Thanks, Bruce. Okay, so long. Uh, let's see. Do you have anything else, Eric? Or if anybody else has a, a question, hit five star. Um, uh, otherwise, I guess we can go ahead and uh, wrap it up. Any final thoughts or comments or anything, Eric? No, I think I've pretty much covered it all. Okay, and I just emailed Ernst. Just give him a heads up that uh, that you'll be ready in about forty minutes for for his call. Okay. And so, oh, let's see. Okay, we do have another question. Um, if your end, number ends in thirty four seventy three, um, go and say your name, where you're from. Go and ask your question. Hi, it's uh, Danny from Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada. Um, uh, why two towers on the? Uh, the model that's being built right now. Is that clear? Did, did you get that, Eric? Why are there two? No. Why are there two no. towers? Yeah. What? What? No, Tesla. I, I, I know I, Tesla originally envisioned that. So I'm um, sorry, but you didn't get to build that. So how would that work? Uh, I didn't get the question. Can you relay that, Aaron? The Colorado Springs model that you guys are building is two towers? Uh, why? Two what? Uh, he, he said two towers. I mean, there's a transmitter no, there, and a there's receiver. A, there's, a, there's, a, there's a transmitting and a receiving unit. Oh. It, ha it has to be a curious. closed system. Otherwise, the thing will transmit into the wiring of the, of the building that the presentation is going to be given in and burn out all their digital. Oh. <laughs> okay. All righty. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Danny. Yep, thanks. Uh, let's see. Anybody else have any questions? Okay. So, again, uh, Eric's website is um, ericpdollard.com. And if you'd like to uh, uh, help pitch in to the uh, nonprofit, it is a 501c3 um, charitable uh, nonprofit organization. So any uh, – Donations are tax deductible. Um, you can get the details on how to donate by PayPal or uh, snail mail uh, in the right column of ericpdollar.com. Also, his upcoming uh, two presentations, uh, the Colorado Springs uh, replica and demo, as well as uh, a presentation on uh, seismic uh, forecasting technologies and science, 
will be at the 2019 Energy Science and Technology Conference. That will be the uh, eighth annual one uh, that we put together in Hayden, Idaho, and it will be January 11 to 14. And Hayden, Idaho is um, it's at the Hayden Eagles Lodge, which is um, in Hayden. It's about 50, 55 minutes from the Spokane International Airport. Spokane, Washington is all the way on the east side of the state by the uh, Idaho border. It's uh, the opposite side of Washington from Seattle. And so uh, it's limited to about 150 people every single year, um, just because that's the size of the venue for the uh, uh, the conference room. Um, we're getting close to 50% of the seats are already sold out. And so there's about 80-something seats left. Um, so you can go to energyscienceconference.com. You can click on the Register Now link, and then you can go ahead and register there, and you can either pay by PayPal or to avoid any of the extra PayPal fees that are added on, you can send in a check or money order. Um, and let's see. I, I, we can take another question here. Um, go ahead, Winston. Let me, let me go ahead and unmute you here. Okay, go ahead. Oh, hi, Eric. Now, this question is mainly for you. Will Eric's presentation at the conference be videotaped? Yes, both of them will be videotaped, and they'll be available as paid digital downloads. It'll uh, typically be an MP4 video, plus the PowerPoint is usually converted into a PDF, and those are available in the zip file. And so, yes, both of them will be recorded and made available that way. Okay, thanks. Sure. Uh, let's see. In, we're uh, we're going to be running out of time here. Um, let's see, Annis, I see you got another question. If we can just kind of keep it brief because we've got to get uh, Eric off the phone to get on to another call here uh, shortly. Um, go ahead, Annis. Perfect. Yes, uh, thank you so much. It's just a very, very quick clarification. So uh, when the expressions for the DC operators are found um, in, ter in terms of their function, it ends up becoming the hyperbolic coast minus the hyperbolic sign for one pole and then the hyperbolic coast plus the hyperbolic sign for the other. And those two are just basically exponentials. And then it's mentioned in particular that um, it's only valid for the whole alpha squared minus uh, beta squared equals one. So is that essentially saying that the part of the exponential curves that are bounded inside that hyperbola, that's what's valid for the values of the DC? Yeah. Okay, perfect. 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 Thank you so much. Now, there, there's, a, there's a book uh, that's helpful with that uh, by uh, Arthur Kennelly. Uh, it's uh, I forget the exact title, but it's uh, ap hyperbolic uh, something applied to electrical engineering, and uh, I would recommend reading that book. There's another one called Artificial Electric Lines that also gets into the hyperbolic theory. Kennelly was the one that introduced the, the hyperbolic uh, theory concept into electrical engineering, which led to Steinmetz's equations. Perfect. I've written both of those down. Thank you so much once more. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up, Eric. Thanks for your time. Um, this, uh, For everybody's information, this is uh, uh, recorded and will be available on a YouTube video um, probably sometime this week or next week. And uh, we'll, have, we'll be posting more papers on uh, Eric's website, and we'll give uh, notifications when... Uh, uh, the books that Simon is uh, formatting right now will be available on Amazon. Um, also, uh, if you want to contact Eric directly, use the Lone Pine address, uh, General Delivery, which is posted in the right column at ericpdollar.com. There's also information on how to make any uh, donations to EPD Laboratories, Inc. And also, um, you know, come uh, hang out with us at the conference, middle of July, energyscienceconference.com. So um, thanks a lot, everybody. Muted. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week. You Thank too. you. Thank you.